As the crowded Democratic primary race for the 2020 election carries on, voters appear to be coalescing around a narrowing field of realistic choices. The tier one choices at the moment appear to be Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Pete Buttigieg. These four candidates are the top four in the national polls, each with more than 10% support, according to the RCP averages, and each has their own advantages. Joe Biden probably has the best name recognition in the field and is polling in first nationwide. Bernie Sanders has raised the most money from supporters and has the greatest number of donors. Elizabeth Warren is the only candidate to have, although briefly surpassed Biden in the national polls, leads in her home state of Massachusetts, and remains in second in Nevada, South Carolina, and California. Pete Buttigieg is currently surging nationwide and leads in both Iowa and New Hampshire. It would be difficult for any candidate not already in the top four to break through at this stage of the game, but that doesn't mean that everyone else in the race should pack their bags. Andrew Yang, for instance, has shown remarkable progress for a political outsider, and the longer he fights on, the more seriously mainstream Democrats are likely to take his central issues data rights, automation, and universal basic income. While there are good reasons to cast a cynical eye on Bloomberg's run, his financial power is formidable, to say the least. Deval Patrick, too, just joined the race, and while I doubt his experience at Mitt Romney's vulture capitalist firm, Bain Capital, will do much to earn him a place in the hearts of Democratic voters, it may be a tad too early to totally dismiss him out of hand. With a number of candidates recently dropping out, Wayne Messam, Joe Sestak, Steve Bullock, and Kamala Harris, it seems reasonable to ask, who should be next? Tom Steyer has managed to make it onto the debate stage twice now, passing the polling and fundraising threshold set by the DNC. For most, his appearances have been somewhat underwhelming. But if he's doing so poorly in the debates, you may ask, how has he managed to do well enough in the polls and in fundraising to make it onto the debate stage at all? Well, unlike most candidates, Steyer's campaign is astoundingly self-funded. While most campaigns release ads in part to help fill their campaign coffers, Steyer is losing astronomical amounts of money with every ad buy. According to CNN, by October 10th, he had spent over $30 million on ads across television and social media. As a result, he raised a paltry $2 million from less than 160,000 unique donors. Meaning, for every dollar he spends in ads, he takes in less than 7 cents. Not exactly a promising return on investment. A businessman should know better. But of course, Steyer's goal is not to get his message out there so that the people will help fund his campaign. His goal is to directly earn support from uncommitted or uninformed voters through ads purchased from his own pocketbook. His wager is, essentially, that he can buy his way into the White House. This graph from 538 shows the ad spending of different campaigns. Steyer's ads are represented in green. As you can see, while Steyer remains a relatively minor candidate in terms of polling and fundraising, he is outspending his primary rivals many times over. At the current count, Steyer has already spent a whopping $46 million. That's a massive figure, but no surprise, given that Steyer is a billionaire and in 2016 was the second biggest Democratic donor in the presidential race. Now, if we extend the graph just slightly to today, we see the big problem for Steyer. There's another billionaire in the race, one with even more money than Steyer, who actually topped the charts as the number one biggest Democratic donor in the 2016 race. Michael Bloomberg in the last week of November and in December so far is putting his resources to work, outspending even Steyer many times over. Bloomberg has already spent $31 million. If Steyer's strategy is to just use his money to outspend everyone else in the field, Bloomberg seems to be the only guy who can outdo him. He's quite simply got more money to burn. On top of that, Bloomberg's spending is more likely to drive his standings in the polls and with donors. He might be quite unpopular amongst Democrats, but at least Bloomberg has experience beyond funding campaigns. He's got actual executive experience, having served as the mayor of New York. That's not exactly sufficient experience for most presidential hopefuls, but it is more than Steyer, and even more than Pete Buttigieg, who is currently showing strong promise in the national and early state polls. Without original policy ideas, strong debate chops, or experience in politics, Steyer's got virtually zero chance of catching fire as a candidate organically. 
His only advantage has been his ability to self-fund his campaign. Bloomberg's entry in the race totally eliminates that advantage. Not only should Steyer drop out, he should do so ASAP, because unlike with most Democratic candidates, it's his own money he's wasting. From the ultimate political insider to the ultimate outsider, Marianne Williamson should also probably drop out of this race. Williamson has said that she's going to stay in the race until the money dries up. Bless her heart, I love the orb mother, but it's hard to imagine that her campaign has any reason left to exist at this point. Early on, Williamson was able to get onto the debate stage and bring up her issues. At times, she even had reasonably good performances. She can even take partial credit for the fact that one of her top issues, reparations, became a topic of conversation in the debates. Enough so that even Pete Buttigieg, who enjoys very little support from the black community, would attempt to win over black voters with his Douglas plan. Despite having no experience in politics, Williamson has managed to make a bit of a mark. She should be proud of what she's done and hang her hat on it. Now that there's very little else she can do, polling at 0.4% in the RCP averages, she has no hope of returning to the debate stage or gaining more attention in the mainstream media, as the field narrows in on more serious prospects. Like Marianne Williamson, Michael Bennett is no longer likely to gain any real attention in the mainstream media or make it on stage for future debates. Despite his past debate appearances, he's failed to make much of a mark and is currently polling at just 0.8% in the RCP averages. He was also one of the lowest fundraising candidates in the third quarter, but for some reason he's pledged to stay in the race, at least until New Hampshire. There's no reason for him to do that. As Colorado's senior US Senator, he's got bigger fish to fry than a campaign going nowhere slowly. John Delaney's reasons to drop out are so numerous that it's a small wonder he even remembers what it was like to be on the campaign trail. Sure, unlike Bennett, he's got little else going on in his political career, having concluded his work in the House of Representatives in January. But like Bennett and Williamson, his appearances in the early Democratic debates gained him little traction. He is currently polling at just 0.6% in the RCP averages, that's 25% less than Bennett, although with numbers this small, his total support is well within the margin of error for most polls. Delaney's run is also comparable to Steyer, as before Steyer came around, Delaney was the self-funded candidate. Delaney's campaign is actually one of the better funded ones, with over $27 million. All but $3 million of that, however, came from his own bank account. If Steyer should drop out, now that a bigger self-funded campaign has entered the contest, it's astounding that Delaney hasn't caught on that he's wasting his money. Having launched his campaign all the way back in July of 2017, Delaney has been in this race for literally years longer than the major candidates. The only benefit of his enduring efforts would be a Guinness World Record for longest lived campaign failure. Although a far more plausible candidate than anyone I have mentioned so far, Amy Klobuchar might seriously consider dropping out as well. When it comes to fundraising, she's raised about the same amount as Beto O'Rourke, who has already left the race. Polling-wise, she's in 8th place with 2.4% in the RCP averages, not exactly remarkable for an experienced US Senator. And all of this is after two debates where she clearly performed significantly better than she had previously. In other words, if Klobuchar was going to surge into serious contention, she would have done so already. The real trouble with Klobuchar is that she offers very little, not already offered by a higher polling candidate. You want an experienced politician with moderate ideology? You've got that with Joe Biden, the leader in the national polls. Are you a moderate who thinks Biden's better days are behind him? Well, in fourth place and surging in the early states, you've got Pete Buttigieg, who clearly represents a new generation of moderate Dems. Do you not care about ideology and are instead focused on gender? You want a woman president? Well, your best bet in this case would be Elizabeth Warren. She's in third place nationally, and in the first two states. 
Booker too is showing weak numbers in the polls even after the fifth Democratic debate where he delivered what was probably his best performance in the primary race so far. He's polled at just 1 or 2 percent since then, retaining an overall RCP average of just 1.8 percent. In terms of fundraising, he's raised about $18.5 million and spent 14, meaning he's not saving much cash on hand for an ad blitz in the offing. Booker has a ton of charisma and solid experience, but it appears that voters just aren't buying what he's selling. To totally butcher an expression Booker introduced to me in a dazzling debate moment, he's selling the Kool-Aid, but nobody wants the flavor. Julian Castro's campaign has shown a number of signs of impending doom. He's begun to struggle to make thresholds required to make the debates, and as I've previously reported, he's shutting down what ought to be major campaign operations in New Hampshire and South Carolina. Sure, the official line is that this is to focus on other critical states, like Iowa, where he is polling in 12th place, Nevada, where he is polling in 10th place, and his native Texas, where he is polling in 7th place. But with less than a million dollars cash on hand and declining presence in the press, it's hard to see his prospects as anything other than a wild long shot. The reality is that despite being a recurrently forceful presence on the debate stage, Castro was essentially put in a no-win situation after his infamous clash with Joe Biden. After asking Biden, did you forget what you said two minutes ago, and repeating that line of attack, the mainstream press repeatedly reported the encounter as Castro making a distasteful swipe at Biden's age. In my opinion, Castro was correct in calling Biden out, and I broke that down in my analysis of the debate at the time. But I would go on to also predict that Castro would suffer in the polls, and that in the next debate, he'd be between a rock and a hard place. He would have to choose to double down on his aggressive debate style, one of his only advantages in the primary race so far, or bend to media pressure and soften his approach. Castro seemed to do the latter. As a result, his last appearance on the debate stage was unremarkable, and the already low polling candidate was lost in the shuffle. Now, it may seem a little mean-spirited to suggest that many of the long-shot campaigns should end soon, but as the primaries and caucuses draw nearer, pruning the crowded field may be extremely useful for Democratic voters. Crowded debates tend to translate into little substance, as minor candidates attempt to make their mark with attacks on major players, who themselves benefit most by conveying as little meaning as possible in order to avoid rocking the boat. With numerous candidates, it also becomes next to impossible for working Americans to sufficiently research each of their available options. In this way, dropping out of the race is not just the right thing to do in terms of time, energy, and resources for a variety of candidates, it is also the right thing to do, morally, for Democratic voters and the American people. For that reason, I will end this video honoring the departed campaigns of the Patriots, who have respected the voters enough to recently remove themselves from the race. But of the 15 candidates still taking up valuable airtime, I ask, how many are wasting everybody's time? How many are continuing on out of sheer vanity, stubbornness, and fantasy? And how many actually have a message worth listening to? And of those, how many really deserve serious consideration? The Democratic Party has not always opted for the best choice when it comes to presidential nominees. It may be time for many of the long shots to step aside so that the voters can inform themselves about the realistic options and decide who should be next. I am running for president of the United States. Well, and <laughs> I'm very excited about it. Don't kid yourself. Steve Bullock of Montana. Uh, who else? Uh, Seth Moulton of Massachusetts. Seth Moulton and then uh, Wayne Messam. Yeah. And Wayne yeah. Messam yeah. didn't make it. I think a lot of people are seeing this announcement and are saying, who? From where? Explain. We really are really looking at how we can improve the lives of America. As your president, we can accomplish our agenda together before the hour is too late. It was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. Let's give American people a second chance at that American dream, the same American dream that attracted my parents to this country. And an attack on public lands anywhere is an attack on public lands everywhere. I've walked 400 and 22 miles across Pennsylvania one time. 
And that little girl was me. Because this is about making room for someone that actually won in a Trump state. I'm the only Democrat running for president that actually won in a Trump state. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, definitely Snoop. Uh Uh-huh. Tupac, Tupac. for sure. For sure. The job is not to tell people what they want to hear. The job is to tell people what they need to hear. She put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. Like and I and I inhale. I didn't. I did inhale. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place. King George of England, when he heard about it, said. That is the most remarkable man who has ever existed. Um, My campaign for president simply does not have the financial resources to continue. As your president, we can accomplish our agenda together before the hour is too late. First, ensure American working families succeed. Empower workers with paid family and medical leave benefits and also childcare.